Well, thanks very much for coming. Um, this is what I'm going to say, so I'll just sort of steal you. Um, sometimes I have numbers in the corner of the slide that give you an idea of when I'm going to finish, but, uh, you know, sorry, I've forgotten them. So, um, I hope people know what LibreOffice is. Do they know what LibreOffice is, generally? Who doesn't know what LibreOffice is? Who does know what LibreOffice is? Everyone else is apathetic. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Well, anyway, the people who aren't apathetic uh, know what it is. So, um, it does all sorts of things. You know, text, text documents, obviously word processing, uh, spreadsheets, uh, presentations and drawings. A database are built in. Uh, I think certainly for larger deployments, database is probably a liability, um, but never mind. Um, we can import lots of files, so like 172, 175 import filters. The important ones, obviously, are Office, uh, the Office file formats, the Microsoft ones, and our own, own open document format. Um, but we do loads of things. Visio. I mean, I, I've seen grown men with tears in their eyes because their Visio license has been taken away from them. Um, interestingly, Visio costs almost as much as the whole of Microsoft Office. Word, PowerPoint, Excel, uh, Outlook. All of that costs the same amount as, as Visio, which is quite weird, isn't it? It makes you wonder which part of the market has competition in it, doesn't it? You know? I don't know. Oh, it makes me wonder that. Anyway, so we're, we're having a serious uh, impact on, on the market, I think, there. Um, and we're trying to obviously always improve in all of these areas. Uh, Quark Express, some of these uh, Microsoft Publisher, Apple, Apple file formats. We can even import uh, Microsoft Works files, if anyone can remember that uh, disaster area. But the, the, the clear focus is on interoperability. So uh, the, the old binary uh, file formats and their template and macro variants. The new OpenXML ones. RTF which is the legacy of a, a, a previous standards war, uh, you know. So uh, if you like a cyclic, cyclical view of history, you know, RTF is the ODF of the, of the past, or what came out of it. And of course, open document. It's about Google, uh, the Google Docs? Sure, so Google Docs has um, an internal model it uses for its documents. Um, and nobody really knows what that is. But my suspicion is it's moving more closely towards Microsoft's model. And uh, the reason for that is that they use LibreOffice to convert, actually generate ODF as it comes out of that. So if you download an open document file from Google Docs and you look at the generator tag in it, you'll say it says LibreOffice 5.2. Uh, <laughs> what fun. Anyway, so uh, yes, I don't know. But they have an internal model. But of course, they, they, they often save in these formats. And you know, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's a reasonably complicated um, world. And there's a community uh, of people out there, you know, a couple hundred million people using it, um, around a thousand people developing it, uh, about a hundred localization teams. Uh, so, you know, in terms of fully translated language, it's 62 on PC and about 33 on online. Around 300 individual code committers each year. And everything's developed in public. And people love us. You know, look at these, these Berlin Federal Ministry of uh, Technology, uh, Economics Technology using this. Or in Rome, we were just in Rome. Uh, welcome. Um, uh, a few months ago for our conference. And this is the room, the very room that the Treaty of Rome was signed in, that, that founded the European Union. Look at that. So I, I've, I've spoken there. And as an English person, that's, uh, you know, <laughs> something special. Anyway, so, uh, and uh, here, here's how the code contributors break down. So uh, Calabra is probably the biggest, then Red Hat, volunteers, various other people, but loads and loads of commits from a diverse set of uh, people. So why, why migrate to uh, LibreOffice? Well, I think saving money has to be the, uh, you know, one of the key drivers uh, that we provide. Um, but I think actually, you know, by having simpler, better quality documents that don't codify loads of random feature choices that Microsoft has made over, you know, 30 years, um, you, can, you can really get a better, better set of documents. And so when you want to do things with them, extract text from them, automate them, integrate them with other systems, you're just in a much better, cleaner place. It's like moving from HTML to HTML, XHTML or something, HTML5. You know, there's, a, there's a serious cleaning going there. But as well, using that cost saving, you can train your staff. And so actually you can get this win where you save money, you improve productivity, and you also de-louse your business process. So you find all of the horrible things that shouldn't exist, or many of the horrible things, as you start to look at how people are using their office suites and what they use them for. And I'll show you some case studies uh, on that at the end. So one of the things I, as a, as a self-interested vendor, uh, would say is that it's important 
uh, for enterprises, uh, large enterprises really, to do this with someone who knows what they're doing. And uh, there are great ways to do that, but the key thing there is to get the economics right so the ecosystem funds itself. And also make sure you have a good experience too, that you don't get blocked on some kind of nasty problem that stops, uh, frustrates users. Of course, everything we do is open source. So uh, yeah, do it yourself as possible. I know people who have built their own houses. Um, I quite like that sort of thing. You know? well, when I had more time, I liked that sort of thing. You know, my own wiring, I've done it. Um, the gas boiler maintenance, you know, uh, in the UK, so you're not supposed to do that. But I've seen it done by uh, uh, people who are not qualified. Um, there are some risks to this, uh, and you may, you know, even be required in many circumstances, you know, to get it signed off by a professional. Um, it would seem ironic to be in a building where the lift is uh, certified by someone and signed off, and all of the wiring is, but the software on the machine you're using is not supported by anyone. Uh, you know, it does happen. Um, Unfortunately. So anyway, there are links here to get uh, expert help, and, and LibreOffice provides a certification program so that you can be sure that these people have done it before. You know, they're, you're not just outsourcing your competence problem to someone who doesn't know what they're doing either. Um, so yes, and, and you can get you know nice uh, supported versions and so on. Well, how to do it? How to do it? So this is the one piece of advice I give to people when we go to tell them about how to do it, and almost everyone ignores it. So anyway, I will just I will say it again because it's it's good for me even if it's fundamentally useless. So so the first recognition is that there's a whole load of people um, who are have have limited use of an office suite. So why don't we find the people who are you know really power users for whatever that that power user means? Maybe they have some giant access human resource database that's tied to an Excel spreadsheet that generates a thing and it's all written in some weird macro language. Uh, and so it can't, they can't be transitioned. Let's find those people, and then let's find all the other people in the organization, you know, the prison parole officers who are just typing words into documents uh, that are all the same, uh, and then we'll migrate them and not the HR people. So that's great. So we have to segment the users. Um, the problem is when you decide to use, uh, how do you interoperate between them? How do you cooperate? Well. So if you ins say we use the Microsoft file formats, the problem is that you move all of the interoperability problems onto Microsoft's turf. Everything is then our fault, right? Much better to move all the interoperability problems onto our turf and not have any, right? So if you install CollaborOffice, LibreOffice everywhere, you have really, really wonderful 100% interoperability between all of these PCs are using it, even across Linux, Mac, uh, you know, Windows, obviously. Um, and we interoperate with ourselves really well, in the same way that Microsoft interoperates with itself really well. You know, that's not the hard bit, right? Um, although actually it is quite hard, and, it, and if, you, if you use different versions of, of Microsoft even, you'll, you'll see, or different platforms, like the Mac version versus thing, you're like, oh, exciting. So, you know, it's, it's not like it's e easy, but it's, it's, it's really a lot easier. So the first thing to do is to realize, and this is the fundamental realization, that you can install on the same Windows machine both LibreOffice, CollaborOffice, or, and Microsoft Office. So these guys here, they get two Office suites. But that's their fault. They have weird power user strange requirements, right? Everyone else just gets a CollaborOffice. And so this means that you can then slowly uh, you know, get rid of the Microsoft Offices there, and everyone can exchange open document formats from, as it were, day one. Or at least the people who are trying to do the right thing, which is probably a minority to start with, and exchange open document formats, have a good experience. Um, so, so this is what we recommend people to do. Inevitably, I tell this to people, and they're like, oh, yeah, but, you know, yeah, well. And then they go and configure it to use Microsoft file formats instead, and then we end up fixing lots of problems for them. But still, you know, there are, there are better things to do, but it's, it, you know, it works actually both ways. So in terms of preparing a pilot and going to the people, the thing that doesn't work is saying, look, I've installed both of these on your machine. Please try the other one sometime and let me know what you think, because we're, we're changing at some stage. <clears throat> no one does that until you actually do the switch, and then they actually do it. And then they go, oh, it didn't work. And you say, but I asked you six months ago to tell me, and you didn't tell me anything. And, and they go, yeah, yeah, but well, well, you know. And they look embarrassed, but it doesn't work. So instead, it's much better to um, to take some people inside each of your verticals, so you've identified your nice vertical. And the traditional approach is to find the power user here. 
because he will train all of the other users. He is a, a, you know, an amazing computer user and the person everyone goes to when they have a problem. And this is normally a really good way to do it, I, I think. The, the problem with this is that a lot of the things that need fixing in documents are very small and very, very simple. And many people feel embarrassed asking a power user to fix their document for them, so instead they, they wrestle quietly and get frustrated. Um, and so this actually doesn't work terribly well. What you, to, find, uh, to find the real problems that they're going to wrestle with, you need probably the worst person with computers in the department, as well as the best person. You know? And so you can then you know, take the other thing off their machines and see, see what happens for a week. And then you know, when they find problems, roll it back and just build a good set of where are the issues for these people, if, if there are any issues. And then, of course, you can either mend the documents yourself or get fixes. Um, th there's some quite silly things going on there. So, yeah, getting the least tech-savvy tech person on, on the team can, can be quite helpful. Um, I guess the, the real key, though, is, is finding the templates and those things that are used everywhere, um, particularly macros. You know, macros have a, uh, a capacity to infect hundreds of documents. You know, in, in the world of uh, computing, we talk about object-oriented design, you know, splitting code from data. And document macros do exactly the opposite. They, like, jam whole loads of code into every document, which is then copied and changed, and, you know, it's, it's a sort of spreading nightmare. Um, and so we can do a whole load of things to fix those templates and make those macros just work. That then just makes this whole slew of problem disappear. Um, anyway, so, but there are costs and benefits to everything. But if, clearly it makes sense for us to fix, uh, you know, as a supplier, it makes sense for, for Collabora to come and fix your software so it works perfectly for your templates. Um, because there's so many documents, you know, you can have 100,000 documents with one template quite easily in organization. And it's really nice if the logo in the top left-hand corner that's, you know, looks different slightly when we're using it because there's a weird EMF that's from Windows 95 in it. If this, this actually renders nicely, it just saves everyone, you know, breath, uh, which is good. Um, but, of course, this is really, I mean, if, if, if the documents, of course, aren't really used, and, you know, they're, they're more of an archival thing, why bother touching? Why, why bother even fixing them? Um, you know, people can live with a, a slight pixel going wrong somewhere there. Fix, fix the new ones, and going forward, everything is fine. So, again, minor tweaks. So there's a balance between, you know, how predominant or how widespread the document is, the cost of fixing, and many of these fixes are very trivial. Like, it, it doesn't cost a lot of time necessary to fix it. Um, and so, yeah, you just need to, you need to look at What's the benefit, you know, versus the costs there for, you know, fixing, fixing things? Uh, so the, there is a migration protocol, which I mostly agree with, uh, that you can download, which writes all of this stuff out. Um, there are various books, you know, that are versions of this. They're very long, and they're quite boring. Um, they're basically just change management, and anyone who's in IT has done change management. No one likes change. So that's, that's the punchline. So how can you creep the change up on them, you know? and make it seem like it's, uh, it's all progress, right? Um, so, you know, but, but, but this is common, whether you're replacing a router in your, in your network or whether you're, you know, putting a new voice over IP phone system in or a new Wi-Fi access point that they have to type. I mean, like, th this happens all the time, right? Um, but one of the nice things is, yeah, so they talk here about macros. I, I, I slightly disagree with their emphasis on rewriting macros. I think it's a complete waste of time. Uh, I think you should just make them work and, you know, templates, so some, some bits there. So we've been writing a whole lot of tooling to try and make things easier and unblock our migrations that get stuck. Um, so we have a particularly fun customer, and I'll do a case study at the end, that has some of these problems. But um, one of the problems is that people write Visual Basic line of business applications that do silly things. So, you know, there's a parking meter system, and it's been written in Visual Basic. <clears throat> and that Visual Basic app uses Office to do all of its charting or drawing or printing of things, it, you know, fiddles with a document and prints it out, mail merges it, whatever. And uh, that's all well and good, <clears throat> but these things are often written long ago. Um, the one I'm particularly looking at is a thing called Patient Center, uh, which is used in uh, Ulster, and there is an HPUX mainframe. Uh, the Visual Basic connects to it and screen scrapes it, and it produces documents which it then prints out and emails to customers saying, you know, you have inoperable cancer or you should come and, you know, have a scan or this kind of thing. And it's quite important that you get the right answer out of the end. But the whole technology stack is a disaster. And 
when you look at it, you start tracing it, it's written in a mix of VB5 and VB6, and it looks for Java as well on your system. And it just, you know, it, it's kind of weird. And of course, it's written by a, a system integrator who, you know, charges so much money just to get out of bed in the morning, it's not even worth talking to them. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if we could write a tool that would trace exactly what it's doing at a COM level, because these are COM components it's using, and then just redirect that to Collabora uh, Online. So um, I have a little video of that going on somewhere. Somewhere. Where is my nice video? Uh, huh. Let me see. There's a VLC thing here somewhere. Except my... Um, oh, yeah, there we go. Um, so, so, so there's a little program. So, so we have a little demo program here, and you can watch it, which online uh, that we wrote ourselves to avoid the embarrassment of, uh, of something else. And this basically just opens a, a couple of documents and goes through them, and then prints a message box and closes them all. Uh, but before it closes, it pops up a dialog saying, <coughs> "You sure you want to close it?" You know, like I mean, there could be something really uh, real in there. Um, so anyway, so Tor makes a nice video of this happening uh, under Microsoft Office. Uh, uh, so this is Word essentially doing it, and it waits, and you uh, you go okay, and then you know asks if you want to close the things, prompts them, and away it goes. Um, but wouldn't it be nice if you could just take that and then run it with no changes to the application um, using Coleap? And so what we do is some some quite clever stuff. We load the DLLs, we look at their linking tables, we patch out whole loads of things. It's, it's some quite nice technology under the hood here. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, we can then load. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, what's it doing now? There's another, another part. So that was Word, whatever it is. Is it playing? It is. OK, so maybe this one time when we do run Word, we'll get LibreOffice. Libre Let's see. Do, 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 do. Aha, look at that. Perfect. So, so then you're getting CollaborOffice instead uh, loading up and uh, showing these things. And then eventually you should get this message box. OK, and you get the prompts and the interaction there, and you close the things, and you're done. So that's, that's basically the vision, that we can take away the horrors of uh, you know, having to deal with impossible to deal with people, and also you know, get some real insight into what your application's doing, and just uh, replace, replace that um, in line. So that's one, one thing. So that's almost sort of outside in, using Office from the outside to write an application. Lots of people use Office from the inside to write applications. So, um, so they write uh, macro-driven nightmares like this one. So um, this is a little spreadsheet. Ignore the black stuff in the background. That's just me programming uh, for fun. Um, so, so this here is actually a Visual Basic program inside a spreadsheet. And um, it's written in VBA. Uh, and it uses some of these nice things, which are these, these form, form controls, he says. Uh, let me just try and make that work. And indeed, it doesn't work. Oh, OK, so there's a sneaky peek you can do. But this thing, I showed it to Nicholas earlier. It worked earlier, right? You know? I don't know. I, that's not very convincing, is it? Let me try and reload it. Uh, maybe it's read only or something. Okay, doke. Yeah, yeah. So you can, you can do your little, little puzzle like this. Um, and if I was good at it, I'd be able to, to solve the puzzle. Um, but this is then all driven by a whole load of macros, uh, which are essentially written in VBA under the hood. So, um, so tools, macros, edit macros. And then you have to find them. Uh, that's the real annoyance in this thing. It's not as good as it could be, this, this editor. Uh, but I think, I think you can go, uh, OK. So we can probably see the forms here, which are effectively the, uh, the Microsoft forms. And then you can start to see all of this effectively Visual Basic code. And so we have a thing called Star Basic built in. But if you put option VBA support 1 at the top, ha <laughs> it becomes as VBA compatible as possible. And so the object model that we use, well, the other thing you'll notice is that almost all macros are extremely banal. Like, uh, you know, there's almost nothing in here that any programmer would be proud of. And that's absolutely typical. Um, but here's at least something that's doing something in object module. So we're taking this sheets, sheets object, which is keyed off the application object, which is implicit, and then looking some stuff up and, and doing things. So this works reasonably well. Um, it's not perfect. It's certainly not perfect, but it's pretty good. We can solve a lot of simple macros out of the box, and even some quite silly ones. But it turns out that the cost of translating your VBA macro to star basic and revalidating that it works is approximately the same cost as just improving the VBA interoperability so it just works. Um, the problem with this is that that document was copied a million times with the same macro in it, and you've no way of finding those. And if you do it this way, 
everyone benefit. So we encourage all our customers to do this, and incrementally we are filling out the puzzle and making it uh, work nicely. Autotext is another thing that lots and lots of people use for writing letters. You know, there's only two bits of entropy in many letters that people send. And uh, they use, you know, autotext with pictures and, and stuff in. And so we've been improving things there. Um, fonts are very important to the layout of documents. So how the spacings work in fonts is vital. Um, and the world is increasingly solving this problem. Well, actually, Google is, to be fair. Um, they're funding a whole lot of things. So initially, Liberation Sans, the, the old fonts that we, we saw up to Office 2007. And then the C-Star fonts, uh, Kalido and Carlito, there's one for the monotype fonts, but honestly, fixed width fonts are not a problem from a metric perspective. Um, when it comes to symbols and webdings, wingdings, and so on, we have a monster font that maps, uh, and a big mapping table that maps all of those weird glyphs to our weird glyphs in open symbol. And these are mapped on the way in and reverse mapped on the way out. Nicholas. Uh, I just thought, do you um, substitute the, the font when you open the document that uses, let's say, Arial yes. Narrow? Definitely. Okay. Ab absolutely. So, so if, you, if you have a Microsoft Office file, a docx or something, and it's got a, an Arial or you know, Times New Roman in it, we bring it in. <coughs> we show the, um, the use of Times New Roman in italic, because it's not really that. That's what it said it was. Um, we actually use Liberation Serif. And so it should lay out exactly as it did. And when we save it, we know that Liberation Serif should be mapped to Times New Roman, so we save that back in the file format. We send it to someone else. So, so it should round trip very smoothly. That's the, that's the hope. Yeah, so, so we bundle the fonts as well. I mean, Microsoft's approach to font interoperability is very simple. Bundle all the fonts. So they're all bundled with Office, and then they have the same fonts everywhere. Interop works perfectly, no font problems. Um, unfortunately, if you try and license just one of these fonts, you discover it costs about the same as Office. So, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting world we live in. Um, so instead, we, we bundle these metric compatible fonts and we have a, have a good time. <clears throat> so then you want to deploy it and everyone comes and says, does it work with SCCM? And I say, uh, yes, yes, definitely. Um, we have people that say it works. I, I don't do a lot on the Windows world, but we provide MSI files as Collabora and MSP patches um, for updating that thing. Um, which is quite useful on low bandwidth links to, uh, you know, sort of branch offices and so on. Um, and here's a whole load of other configuration management s solutions that I'm told it also works with, which are increasingly obsoleted by SCCM. Right um, group policy. So yes, we have ADMX templates, so you can lock this thing down per user, per machine, per everything. And uh, there's a nice UR show in a bit. We love translations. If you want a Swabish translation or whatever, you know, we're, we're open for that. You know. so, uh, and uh, we provide things like you know, uh, changing the default file format, locking stuff down. Please don't change the default file for format, but um, everyone does. So, uh, you know, so you can then lock these things down in these, these nice web. Do you know when you buy manuals and they're full of screenshots? I hate those manuals. But anyway, there you go. Particularly the people who change the screenshot, change the UI regularly, love them because they can sell more books. Anyway, online. So, so another approach is to say, well, let's not install LibreOffice on lots of desktops. Let's not deploy it on the hardware. Let's put it in the cloud. Well, in my cloud, ideally. Um, so Calabra Online or Online is, brings LibreOffice then to the browser. And so you get your documents, your spreadsheets and slides. The code is 98 plus percent reused. Uh, so it's exactly the same thing. You get collaborative editing, presence. It's very Google Docs-like, I guess, in some ways. Same interoperability, same uh, powerful filters. Um, WYSIWYG rendering, we, well, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. But the key thing here is that you can host it. You can host it on your premise, and if you have the right integration, you can make sure the only thing that goes out of your network, out of your control, are screenshot, uh, screenshots, effectively, pixels, uh, and they have someone's name written on them. You can watermark them. So, uh, so you can centrally audit, centrally control, and see where all of the data went. And if you're particularly paranoid, you could probably log keystrokes and work out who typed what when. But there are probably laws against that. Um, so our whole architecture is really a bet on CPU and, and threads there. And of course, there are lots of benefits, um, not just keeping your data in country, because the problem is not just initially you putting your data into a cloud that is in your jurisdiction. I'm sure there's a Google Switzerland somewhere, right? It's not that. It's that someone from North Korea, who's my pet bad person of the moment, can also get hosted in Switzerland very easily, a click of a few buttons, and potentially be exfiltrating your data via some nice CPU processor bug, uh, Spectre, Meltdown, and the other endless Intel uh, problems we've seen. And so being able to control your CPU and your network and who else is sharing it 
It's kind of a bonus. Um, and the good thing is that um, when you're um, sending web links to other people, the document format is much less relevant, as we, as we discussed earlier with, with Google Docs. What format it's in becomes almost, almost irrelevant. Um, yeah, and so uh, the other nice thing is the, the re reduced feature set. People have a lower expectation of online office suites um, because they're used to Google Docs. And actually, Microsoft Word Online is, is a particularly poor example of an office suite. So, for example, it, it's Word, Word Online can't do many of these things here. It can't do redlining. If you, if you try office.com, it's not going to redline for you. You can't insert a chart into your word processing document. <clears throat> when it comes to doing columns or you know, footnotes or this sort of thing, yeah, best of luck. You, you've no idea where these things are because it's not a WYSIWYG, a word processor. It's quite, it's quite amazingly poor um, considering the state of, state of the art of document editing. So we can win effectively in this environment. We can make chart editing actually work. And, you know, rich and, and attractive. And, uh, you know, so, so slides pretty much is what it looks like that. And of course, bring it to mobile as well. So you can, uh, you know, have, have fun things there as a responsive UI for the same uh, online collaborative editor. So that's pretty much all I was going to say about migration. I'd just like to go through a quick case study. How am I doing for time? Half an hour. Oh, I should talk more slowly. That's good to know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So does anyone have any questions before I move on to the case study? Do, are there any questions there that jump out? I will look at you one by one until you say no. <laughs> no? Any, any, anything? Mads, are you going to question me? You should do. You know? Enough of this. Enough of this. Okay, fair enough. Let's, let's move on. So Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust is to anyone else a hospital, um, but they like to call it that. And uh, because they do social care, of course. So they care for people in the community. They do sort of child you know, um, uh, abuse. And they do elderly people and looking off. Anyway, it's a huge, huge enterprise. And um, yeah, they're doing a feasibility study on this rollout at the moment. Something like 1,700 staff at the moment of 8,500 have moved there. Um, the blocker to moving more people is these weirdo integrations, like the old applications, the whole islands of staff. Um, have problems with because they need the application to work. So we're working on that. So far, the cost of avoidance is about two and a two twenty thousand, so a quarter of a million euros, something like that. And yeah, they're they're moving relatively rapidly to capture quite a large cost saving on just moving sixty percent of their users. They're a pretty cool trust. So they they try new things. They have pretty much everything in there. Uh, <coughs> so they're big believers in VDI, which makes it easy to do a lot of this transitioning stuff. Uh, so, for example, they just moved uh, something like 450 nurses across um, just by you know, switching the VDI pool they go into. And it's encouraging to note that they got exactly zero support calls from that a week on. So, you know, I mean, it's possible to screw this up, obviously, but uh, if you do it right, there's really no need to. And depending on people's use, you know, obviously, uh, it can just be that easy. Um, so using Chromebooks, a lot of these things as VDI clients, <clears throat> but also uh, PCs and, and some, some laptops, uh, fat, fat client laptops. Um, just to look at their service desk calls, so this came out of, yeah, th these are their slides I'm, I'm showing you, so I kind of stole them from their deck. If you hear them in the voice of their, their people, that would help. But uh, <clears throat> 42 calls against uh, CollaborOffice in that three-month period, um, 24 of these are just people uh, you know, who need to be trained. Uh, often in just using an office suite, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, nine of those are IT issues, like the VDI is not working, it's going slow, but then, well, yeah, there's a massive spike because all the nurses have arrived and left or something, and nothing to do. There's about nine of them collaborative office related, so three a month. And of course, we look at those and try and help fix them for them. 78% of calls logged as collaborative office, nothing to do with the software. Um, so they've done a lot of work then to try and you know, communicate this out there. They built pretty videos with cartoon characters saying how much this is, how this is a good thing. It's going to save everyone money. Posters, presentations, SharePoint site, you know, touchy-feely meetings of share your grief and so on and so on. And emails out there. And of course, still no one actually notices it's going to happen until it happens. And then they complain. They didn't, weren't told. You know. But uh, either way, it, it, it works reasonably well. Um, they did quite a bit of training. Um, so initially, they thought that the key to training was to train people in the difference between Collabor Office and Microsoft Office, as in, you know, here's how they're different. 
it rapidly turned out that the staff were basically incapable of using an office suite anyway, of, of whatever kind it was. And um, the skills were sufficiently poor that you could teach people amazing productivity tips just by telling them about stuff that is completely common to both office suites. And yeah, so they created little manuals and quick guides. Here are your key, commonly used key bindings uh, that are typically the same in both. And you can put it beside your, you know, your desk and you can learn you know, to be quicker, um, which is kind of encouraging on, on one, one side. But unfortunately, only about 80% of them, 18%, actually came to the training. I think it's kind of normal. Um, yes, and I've got some silly graphs later. So when you ask them questions, uh, you know, you say, do you feel confident? And notice the, the, the bottom of the graph is, starts at 45%. But it's about 50-50 on the, do I feel confident making formatting adjustments to documents, change margins, insert page rate just columns. Oh, no, oh, I can't do that. That's absolutely, you know, that's, that's half of them found that too hard. Uh, but then, you know, nearly 70% say they don't think they need any further training. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. It turns out people say any old thing when you ask them questions to a degree, or they just don't want to go to training, uh, or, 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 or something. I don't know. You know, in, interpret it as you wish. Um, but I think the help desk calls are probably a better, better metric of what, you know, what's actually going on. And this is really their conclusion that the vast majority of files are just compatible, um, but depend on the quality of the original document. If you have a document that's a complete mess, um, where you're horribly misusing features, uh, you know, to layer and align and pi pile things up in silly ways, it's certainly possible to create silly documents. Just, you know, almost any small change to this document is going to completely mash it. Um, and, you know, we, we see those. But if you have a reasonably sensible document, uh, life is very, very much easier. They're pleased with our partnership, which is good. Um, and, yeah, this is what they, I guess, they say. They say, but of course they, they recommend that actually you go ahead of this and look at documents and look at processes and try and improve things, um, yeah, before you uh, before it happens. So I just like to show you a whip, whip through some silly samples of cases. Actually, there's one I cut out earlier that's quite funny. So we had um, one of these. There's a, there's a lot of silly things going on. So one of them was, you know, my my form doesn't work. It's got all of these rectangles that are like tick boxes, and everyone. Everyone is printing these things out and ticking them, as you all well, notice the paper in front of you. Um, just like that. But, you know, my, my tick box is gone. It's broken. The software is awful. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's very good. Well, we'll analyze, analyze the thing. Turns out, Microsoft Word, when you insert a character and the character isn't there on the system, you know, like there's, there's a missing glyph in the font, inserts a, a rectangle. Which glyph do you think they used for all of the, the check boxes, you know? And um, so, of course, we just do a much better job of finding, you know, exactly that Korean character with a, you know, whatever, and bingo. It's, you know, some unexpected emoji jumps out instead of... But there's not much that you can do about that short of being just that lame, you know, really. I mean, I suppose, you know, it's possible. But it's hard to diagnose what wasn't on their system, you know, from a distance, so that you can command it. But anyway, there are a number of things like that. So, um, moving borders, so, yeah, if you, if you had very large borders on the right, we couldn't size them, so we fixed that for them. Um, validation drop-downs, so, um, yeah, so you get documents that are generated by third-party systems. This one was a pre-standardized, pre-ISO, open XML file format. Just happens to work in Office still, and we didn't realize that people were, I mean, like, it, it's, it's a weird, never-documented nightmare, but na now it imports nicely, and you get your validity uh, criteria properly. <clears throat> this is a pretty nice one. So the test document had a, a table with a cell whose minimum height like, you couldn't make it any smaller than something bigger than the page. Um, it's just hard to know what you do in these cases, where the document is fundamentally inconsistent. You cannot lay this table out in a way that's consistent. So what do you do? Well, now we abandon our sanity in the same way as, as, as Microsoft does, and it behaves in a more interoperable way, and you, you see your table nicely. Another third-party application generating docx files, but having removed almost all of the content from it. So. Um, you know, it's not valid open XML file, but it turns out there's a whole load of random defaults behind the scenes that are used by Microsoft. Perhaps we should uh, do those too. Um, yeah, some floating table uh, nightmare problems being imported improperly, so, you know, just uh, getting a table is, is kind of nice. But I think probably the more sweet uh, thing here is that people come and say to me, where is the roadmap? And by the roadmap, they want to know, well, they look at two things. How long is the roadmap? As in, I, but I have yet to see a company that says, we plan to go bust here and puts it on the roadmap, like, you know, six months out. I've just never seen it. Um, it, it. It could happen. So I don't think this is a terribly good heuristic to look how long the roadmap is and see, 
you know, if, if they're still going to be around. Um, instantly, we plan to be around forever, but uh, you know, there you go. Um, the other thing they want is to see, is my feature on the roadmap? And there's a much easier way to do that, it's just to come and tell us what feature you want, and then we'll put it on the roadmap, or we'll actually implement it for you. So just run you through some of the things that we implemented uh, for this particular customer, and uh, you know, plenty of other customers. Um, so, so one of the problems they had was there's a, there's a, a spreadsheet which is heavily protected, um, and you enter your time data into it, and this then gets submitted to an automated system, and that then pays you. It's quite nice to be paid. But everybody in the trust already knows this system it's submitted to is broken. It's vital to delete any empty lines, because if you include empty lines in it, it all breaks and you don't get paid, right? Um, problem is, we didn't have this highly granular permission setting for allowing you to delete rows but not columns and this kind of thing. And so they just, they, you know, they couldn't delete their rows and so they weren't getting paid. Bad. Um, so we implemented the feature, added the UI option, everybody gets paid again. Happy. Um, what about uh, the Windows installer? So they didn't want to show draw, math, and base because, well, they're a bit worried about people creating databases. Um, when they go into, I, I talked about process problems. Um, when you go around the organization, they find things and they're like, oh, you're in child protection, and every time you have a new child reported to you, you create a new access database for that child. Interesting. <laughs> you know, hundreds of access databases scattered around the place with Lord knows what in them if they're even being used. So, uh, yeah, so turning off some of these things can help, co configuring it for them. Uh, SharePoint lists. So SharePoint has this wonderful IQY, IQY file format um, with this weird ADA record set stuff in it, and they wanted it in spreadsheets. People wanted that from their SharePoint, so we implemented it for them. A whole lot of people print out documents uh, on paper very regularly, and they want to know which version it is for which kind of person, so they write, you know, client or you know, parent one or whatever on the background. And they were annoyed that it was hard, you know, like you actually had to do 10 clicks. So they got a dialogue instead that made it easy, easy to do them, uh, interoperate it uh, really nicely. As everyone knows, you should store your customer data not in a database, not in a spreadsheet, but in a writer word processing table. Because this is, this is just the best, best place to store large amounts of uh, structured data so you can mail merge from it. Anyway, it turns out this is the flow they wanted. So uh, anyway, we wrote a database connector to extract stuff uh, from effectively tables in word processing documents so that you could, you could mail much. That's what they want. It's the feature we're missing. Uh, so there we go. So many thanks to them. That's just a few examples of some stuff. And at least, you know, the Crown Commercial <laughs> Services and Cabinet Office in the UK are very uh, in favor of that. So the punchline is pretty much you'll have troubles. But don't worry. We can fix them uh, with you uh, and, and get something good. So why training? I mean, uh, this is nearly my uh, ultimate, uh, nearly at the end of the talk. This is a real bug that was reported to the help desk. Uh, you know, uh, Collabor Office is awful because when I type, you know, everything breaks in the, in the layout, right? I get this nice hanging indent, although you notice it's not very perfect here. And it turns out the, the secretary just, you know, has put a whole load of spaces in to, to align it all. And any word processor is not going to work in this environment. There's nothing we can do. And then, of course, you get the geniuses that know more. They know about tabs. So instead, they use tabs to uh, align everything. And actually, this, this real, real example from a lawyer who, who, who works writing text documents all day, every day. That's all he does. And it turns out he's spending a whole lot of time putting tabs and moving them around the document instead of using uh, hanging indents. And, you know, it's still broken, even though I'm cleverer. Um, so, you know, there the really is uh, a bonus from, from actually training. The it's not, I'm not just telling you this. There are productivity wins there that are quite surprising, and it's easy to ignore, you know, the, the training needs at the bottom. Um, it's typical that trainers will start to say the key bindings are the same. You know, if you do control B, you know, you can make something bold, and people go, oh, writing it down. You know, you're like, yeah, okay, fair enough. There are keyboard accelerators. They're kind of cool. There are even tool tips that tell you about them. Um, I, I thought this was a particularly precious one. There was a person there saying, <clears throat> you know, when I, um, I have to fill out this spreadsheet, but sometimes I don't know what to write in a, in a box, so I just leave it blank. And then sometime later, I can't find the blank rows, because it's like, thousand, how, how can I do that? Like, okay, well, we have this auto filter thing, and you, you just click these three buttons, and oh, wow, that's so awesome. Oh, and the other problem is I have, I have to keep going up to the top of the column to find, you know, that I'm typing in the right column. And you're like, 
Yes, yes. There's another, there's another button for that, you know. Uh, Oh, don't tell me anymore. You know, this, is, this has revolutionized my life. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's nice to give time back to these people, you know. Um, this is another favorite one, you know. The document arrives in all caps, and I have to retype it in, in lower case. Is there an easier way, you know? And so it goes, and so it goes. Um, so I, I think there are lots of, lots of good things that can be done to help people um, to, to fill in for the training that probably never happened, uh, either when they were at school. And this is not necessarily old people either. This can be young people straight out of school um, who, who've used Google Docs. They can text on their WhatsApp at top speed. They can probably type reasonably well, but they just don't know how to, to create documents. So there you go. Migrating to LibreOffice is really just change management. You should get certified people. And we have lots of Swiss partners. Adfinis is one here. Look at that. Woohoo! And Colab is another one here. Woohoo! Look at that, you know? So look at that. There are people who can help you. And uh, yeah, I think the fun thing uh, about it really is that you can interact with real engineers. So, you know, we have sort of relatively junior people in, in organizations who, who change software that's used by hundreds of millions of people. You know, they have a huge impact. They can say, well, you know, that was our bug we fixed. That was our, our feature that was added for us because we wanted it and you know, see that impact has on other people. Try doing that with the other lot. Um, getting, getting access to engineers, getting an SLA on having your bugs fixed uh, is, is practically impossible. And I've talked to them, so I, I know. They're well protected. You know, they're, uh, um, so interoperability taste, I'd really recommend you go with ODF for internal document interchange. We can help at the edge with PDF, hybrid PDF, other things. Uh, but you know, many people choose to use OpenXML internally or the binary file formats. We can help with that too, but there's going to be more helping. So, um, and training, yeah. I mean, find out what's going on in your organization. You know, detect those hor horrible things. Fix your business process. And uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, the team there who share share their data with us, and we'd love to uh, work with you and make the future more open. So, that's it. Thank you for your time. You've been very good. <laughs> Any questions? Heckling, tomatoes to be thrown. Anthonis. So I saw that you uh, implemented two more tables sure. a couple of months ago. And I was wondering <coughs> the next big gap that you see uh, where Microsoft is still uh, having a future that LibreOffice doesn't have. Yeah, so pivot tables, I think, have been implemented for many years. But they were called custom something or others. I don't know if you ever did it. Did anyone see the Lindos trademark lawsuit? That's a little while ago. So Lindos filed a trademark on Lindos and then was sued by Microsoft, as you'd imagine. It's like a Linux Windows. And Microsoft settled with them because it turned out the Windows was not trademarkable. It was much too generic. And their whole Windows office, whatever trademarks, were completely unenforceable. And uh, Linda signed a non-disclosure agreement or whatever, and then, but then the SEC forced them to disclose this fact. And shortly afterwards, every, all of these brands were, you know, so Microsoft have backed away from a number of trademarks like Pivot Table. So we now call it a Pivot Table instead of a Data Pilot, oh, which is helpful because that's, that's what it is. Um, so no, we've had that for a long time. In terms of big missing features, I think, um, yeah, so SmartArt, we import SmartArt fallbacks. I, I love the SmartArt feature. I think it's cool. I think... Uh, Having a, a UI that looks more familiar to uh, more recent Office users would be helpful. Um, so, you know, in terms of toolbars and menus. It's interesting that Microsoft's new 2019 ribbon looks very much like our toolbar. It's a single, single row toolbar thing that's coming, coming back there. So there's another massive training inflection point for you guys if you stick with Office anyway. So why not save a lot of money and have fun too? Does that help? Yes. Good. Um, that was a good question. Any other questions? And how, how's the time? Are we? Ooh, I have my moderator still, friend here. A week. You know? Oh, excellent. That's good. Um, other questions? Thoughts? Concerns? Frustrations? Frustrations. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll take frustrations anyway. Yeah. You know, I, I privately end my business, you know, mm. like <clears> the <throat> office. Sure, sure. Sometimes I send of a document for mm. to other people, to other people you know? mm. and it always fails. You know, they're using like mm. you know, Office 365, whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. The problem, just as a feedback to you, mm -hmm, the sure. problem that I often have is that if they have to put some comments, mm. some annotations, yep. you know, then it's, I don't know, it, it doesn't work. It's the feedback I, I get, you know? Yep. And so I cannot convince them to use an open document format. You know? Yep, 
Absolutely. So here is an open document format file that you can load in your web browser. And uh, you know this is this is effectively this is a server in Ireland, and you know you can you can edit and you can do all the, all the fun things that you know so uh, you know you know this is bold and this is underlined and you know all, all of the fun you know things that that are there in, in LibreOffice and work nicely and of course you can comment on that as well except that my screen is um, actually not quite as this you know this is fun um, so so that's all good. Um, <clears throat> but you can send that web link to someone else. You know, you can share this thing um, anonymously or uh, uh, or even not anonymously. Let me just try and find that. So there's a whole load of. I, I'm I'm not an you know I'm a known cloud. Uh, we we have to be very neutral with our partners. So we are. Um, but I just happen to be using this one at the moment. So you can share a link with someone. You can do all of this. You know, password protection if you're particularly paranoid, and you can expire it after 10 minutes, and all of all of that good stuff. And they can then come in and comment on that document, collaborate with you, uh, potentially uh, print it out or you know, do whatever it is that they want to do. And if they're particularly annoyed, they can download it in whatever format they want, pretty much. So quite Google Docs alike. You know. um, so my, my hope is that that starts to solve some of the problem. Um, and of course, all this data is going into your own server under your control, and you can audit and lock that down. But I agree, sending ODF outside organizations <coughs> can be a problem. Um, so we, we also have a thing called hybrid PDF. I don't know if you've seen that. But uh, if you export as PDF, there is a button here. And it essentially embeds the ODF file inside it. So you get a PDF anyone can read with any PDF viewer. But if you load that in CollaborOffice, you get the original editable, commentable, rich content. Um, and that can be also very helpful. Um, as a tool. So that helps with the frustration a bit or? No, no. no it's just, <laughs> you're on some feedback because I Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's very little we can do to improve Microsoft's ODF implementation. That is for sure. Although we're trying. So there is work to get a new version of ODF out, 1.3, and uh, hopefully that will help a little bit. But yes, what can we do? They need more competitive pressure to uh, encourage them to uh, uh, to move in that direction, I think. Good point, thank you. Uh, someone else? I have another one. Oh, well, well, you know, of course, I mean, absolutely, if, if no one else, but you know, look at them all here. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I get like uh, documents, Word documents, mm. and, uh, that have main merge fields. Okay. <coughs> and sometimes <coughs> the formatting, like of, of the numbers mm -hmm. and stuff like mm. that. Mm. I don't know if you also all have this problem. And then send it back to you know, I cannot do any changes and then mm -hmm. send it back to them. Right, right. Yes. <clears throat> so there's a whole lot of different types of fields. Um, let me see. So <clears throat> and there are whole generations of fields as well. So so Microsoft have mm, three, maybe four different field implementations. So when you see a field, it could be any one of those. But the, the, the basic idea that you can fill f forms in and have you know, multi-line content in, in them is, is a good one, and we can do that quite nicely. But there's a whole load of very clever stuff <coughs> in terms of filling fields with content that are looked up elsewhere. And there's a whole powerful query, ma almost macro language, another macro language, that, that does this, um, sucking in them in from elsewhere. There's also DDE links which can suck data in from other documents, which you might not have. Um, and they then allow you to edit them and format them. But there are kind of limitations on that, um, particularly deleting or editing the existing bit, DDE bit. So you can append to it or prepend to it. But I don't think you can do stuff in the middle. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a whole series of features around this that are kind of yeah exciting. Um, and it's an area we're actively working on improving our field support at the moment. So maybe if you have an you know, interesting sample, I could, uh, I could have a look at it. But uh, yeah, there's, there's always more fun in fields. Mm. But the basics are pretty much that. That's what I'm, I'm trying to get across. Sounds good. Anything else? Yeah, fill your form out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A personal question. A personal question. I use Emacs, yes. I'm sorry. What did you see? <laughs> yeah? Do you also use org mode? I don't use org mode. But it's, uh, I should probably know more about Emacs. It always pays me to learn new things. But um, 
Because also they have like a, <coughs> a, an exporter from work mode to mm -hmm. uh, LibreOffice. Sounds good. And I love it. But it's not, it's not always perfect. Ah, uh, well, I'm glad that Emacs is not perfect either. You know, that is good to know, even though it's written in Lisp. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Ed Emacs is the editor for middle-aged computer scientists. So there you go. Uh, you know, if, if you're not middle-aged computer scientist, you're probably uh, not using it. But uh, there you are. <laughs> anyway, it's been very good. Thanks so much for uh, coming and talk to me afterwards, if you want. Okay. <clears throat>